Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, as like all the rest of the people that were before me. Um, today, I'm going to talk about less common use case of Airflow. Um, unlike ETL processes, um, we are using Airflow in the quality phase of our product. Um, today, we are going to see how we gain extreme, extremely high quality level uh, in our product. And I will also explain why we couldn't do it without Airflow. So a bit about me first. My name is Doron Cohen. I'm speaking in Spark Beyond for, I'm working in Spark Beyond for the last four years. Uh, during this time, I did many positions in the company. I was internal data scientist, uh, head of automation, and currently I'm a backend team lead. Uh, before I joined Spark Beyond, I did two degrees in math. And on my second degree, I also uh, made a thesis uh, using machine learning, where I tried to build an uh, investing model for stocks and bonds, which was very interesting for me. Um, and during this experience, uh, I got to know that I'm very, very passionate about machine learning and data science. And the last thing is what I want to do when I will grow up. I want to be a teacher. And I guess that from time to time, you're also going to your parents and tell them about your ambitions. So this is what I did. And when my mom heard it, she saw that I'm insane and suggest me to stick to development. So this is one of the reasons why I'm standing here today. Um, this is the agenda for today, what we are going to cover. Uh, we in this part beyond developing problem solving uh, technology. Um, we are doing it in order to help data scientists doing their work. Uh, and how we are doing it, we have a few products. One of them is Discovery Platform. So in order to get the background for this, this session, we are going to talk about Discovery Platform. We will understand its purpose. Uh, and we also see a nice demo, very simple one, so we will be able to understand. Uh, from there, we are going to talk about quality, which is going to be the problem uh, that we are going to handle. Uh, quality is very important to us, so we're going to see one of the approaches, one, one approach that we took in order to gain good quality. And in the end, we are going to talk about the solution that you probably won't be surprised in going to include Airflow. All of us came to hear about Airflow here. Um, so let's begin. Um, I guess that all of you heard the statement that data is the new oil. Uh, in most of the industries, not in all of them, uh, people, decision makers, try, try to take decisions based on data. And actually, it's very hard to take decisions based on data. You need someone to work on the data and find insight inside the, inside the data. And that someone is going to be the data scientist. Uh, the data scientist, very, very hard work that you need to do. Uh, you need to work on the data. The work is very exhausting, take a lot of time um, and highly cost. So there is a reason why data scientists get paid so well. And we in Spark Beyond uh, took Discovery Platform and automate the manual process that they are doing. So they will be able to concentrate on the impact side of the work, which means taking the insights that Discovery Platform find and use it uh, to get better decision. And as you can guess, bad decision can lead you to lose money. Uh, and no one really wants to lose money. <laughs> and before we are going to see the demo, I have a small disclaimer. The product is a bit flexible, so you might feel that you don't understand everything that you see. It's OK. Try to concentrate on, on the main idea, which is how hard it's going to be to uh, do test and validate the quality of this product. So let's start with the demo. The demo is going to be about the Titanic. Uh, I guess that all of you heard about the Titanic that was sink more than 100 years ago. Um, and there was on, also a movie uh, with uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in the 90s. And this, to be honest, I haven't seen it. I guess that most of the girls saw it. Now. And um, when the ship was sent because it collided with an iceberg, there was uh, more than 1,500 people that were died. And I don't know if you're going to be surprised or not, but there were some group of people that were more likely to survive than others. And in this demo, we are going to use real data uh, of passengers that were on the Titanic. It's a toy problem in machine learning. Machine learning. 
very, very basic one. And we will try to identify those people, those group of people that were more likely to survive the sinking. So let's go and see it in our product. So this is our product. And in a minute, in a sec. Okay, now we can see, oh, sorry. Now we can see that uh, the data that we are going to use, it contains around 900 different lines. Each line, as we can see, uh, represents one passenger that was on the Titanic when it was sink. We can see the name here. We can see also that the passenger has the gender, the age, the fare, the ticket, and so on. And there is also one important column here, the survive column, that tell us if uh, this passenger was survived or not. Uh, unlikely the first one didn't survive. The user, which is the data scientist, also get the ability uh, to understand better his data. We can see, for example, in the age uh, column, the distribution, and if there are missing values, and so on. Afterwards, this is a very simple problem that we are uh, seeing here. So we are going to see the learning node, which is what automates the process of the data scientist. And inside of it, what's important for me now is the target column, which is the column that we are going to predict on, uh, which is the survived column. We can also see that there are a lot of different learning parameters that the user can adjust. There are a lot, more than 100, and it gives the user the flexibility to control what he's doing during, during the learn. Um, he's supposed to understand it. This is the work of the data scientist. And after we saw it, we will click on the play button, and I'm not going to explain what is going on right now, uh, but in very high level, and the system raise hypothesis and select the best hypothesis out of all the hypotheses that were uh, it raised. And it will take a few more seconds. And we can see that there were more than 63,000 hypotheses that were searched during the last 26 seconds. And there were nine insights that were selected and one model was built. And actually, let's see uh, what the insight the system found for us. Uh, before I'm going to review the first one, uh, just imagine what happened when the ship was synced. Probably people start to, sh to scream women and children first. And the first feature is actually equivalent for it. Its name does not contain Mr. Think of it. And we can see that if your name does not contain Mr., your likelihood to survive is almost twice than the prior distribution. Uh, the data scientist, the user, can drill down into the, this feature as for it, any, any of the other features and see some diagrams, some visualization, and some samples that can help him understand the meaning of the feature. The user can also go and see the hypothesis space, which is the space where include all of the hypotheses that were searched during the learn. We can see the complexity of it. For example, see how many lines and how many functions there are. All of them were combined with one another until we got uh, the best features. We can also investigate interesting segments, which are combined from different insights that uh, the system found during the process. For example, I can combine uh, those two features and see uh, those metrics. Uh, if your gender is not male and your P class is not three, uh, your likelihood to survive is approximately two and a half than the prior. And we have ability uh, to see the results of the model. Uh, the data scientist can determine if the model is good enough or not. Uh, I'm not going to get into it because it's not the main purpose here. Um, okay, and probably remember this scene. Um, even though that Leonardo didn't survive, uh, he tried to increase his probability to survive, and he just told her he whisper that his name does not contain Mister, but he didn't know. Them. So uh, I will recap what we've just seen. Discovery platform is just an example. Uh, Discovery Platform is a product that is very general 
and uh, and a very uh, complex process. General because we only ask the user to add data sets that include tabular data set and one column that you want to predict on. And if you want to do other stuff, you can do. And it's end of complex process and therefore you get a lot of flexibility. We saw that there are more than 100 different learning parameters um, that the user can adjust. It gives the flexibility to handle different uh, use case, not just insurance. We can also handle uh, oil search problem, retail, uh, and so on and so on. It's unlimited. Now, on one hand, it gives the data scientist the ability to concentrate on the impact side of his work, where he can take the insight that the platform gives and put them, put them to the decision maker and make the change, move the needle, make the impact. But on the other end, it's, and it's, this is a real but, the user doesn't really know all of the decisions and the calculations that the, the system do under the hood. It's like a black box. And it's a real problem. And the reason for it is if you don't understand the process and you don't really trust it, it will be very hard for you to take the decision and use them. Just think, if you use a product and you know that it's supposed to give you a specific value and instead you get another one. I guess that the first action that you will do, you will close the product and never use it again. Uh, mainly if this product is going to like affect your business and you're going to lose money. Uh, just think about it. Now, as I said before, Discovery Platform is just an example. I guess that many of you have the same issue. You have product that and a complex issue, uh, and therefore, and it's handling it like a black box, and you did need to get the confidence. And how can you get the confidence in the process? You need something that will handle as gatekeeper. Um, why you need such a gatekeeper? Because during your release cycle, during the developing cycle, you are going to enter in code into your code base, uh, new features, new improvement to your code because you want per better performance and so on. And if you want, if you want to do it, you need something that you that will defend you from making mistakes, and your clients won't be affected from it. So, how can we gain this confidence? And what can be such gatekeeper? The answer is pretty simple. It's going to be tests. So, what we did, we looked on the test uh, pyramid and start to work like this. And the first thing was let's take manual testers. So, we took manual testers, and they start work on the product and it was inefficient and highly cost. And the reason for it was for every PR that we merge, we had to run all the tests. So we all understand that it is not enough. Now we said, okay, let's try to automate things. And we said the baseline in the pyramid is unit test, but unit test is not enough. Most of the complexity uh, of the flexibility in the system is happening above the unit level. Uh, so we said, let's try to do integration tests. And we start doing integration tests. And the client got the product. And from time to time, they found issues. And we try to investigate why they get these issues and we doesn't get them. And the answer was pretty simple. They use different permutation of the learning path, which we didn't uh, test it. So we said to ourselves, OK, we can't really uh, create more in the integration test for each one of the permutation, the amount of the mocks that we need to create is numerous. And we said, okay, let's try to do end-to-end -end test. It will give us good coverage as well. So it wasn't good enough because most of the calculations are hidden from the, from the user and the user only see the front end. And therefore we said to ourselves, end-to-end -end test is not good enough. And because of the complexity or the flexibility uh, of the learning parameters, we had to find a kind of test that can be scalable and stable. So we said to us, let's try to do API tests, which are tests where we are sending requests and getting in response, getting back a response. Now I need to, to answer two questions. The first one is why or how API tests can be stable. And the second why, the second question is how can I scale them up? So let's begin with the first question. How can I make the uh, API test stable? And it's pretty easy if you think about it wisely. Uh, first of all, I can assert that the, in the response, the data exists. Afterwards, I can assert if 
the type of the data is the correct type, the type that I expected it. And if I want to assert on numbers, I can do it as well. But I need to do it wisely. Uh, instead of asserting specific value, I will assert on ranges. For example, all of you who took statistics uh, supposed to know that correlation is always in the range between minus one and one, so why not use it? Uh, another thing that I can do, I can test monotonically. For example, in uh, Discovery Platform, I know that my insights are organized by their score. Doesn't matter what this uh, value and how it's calculated. Uh, I can assert that the score is centered. And last but not least, I, can, I have the ability to compare my results to results of previous runs. We'll see later on what we did. So finally, we got to talk about Airflow. And this is the uh, basic DAG, the first one that we are seeing. And as you can see, this DAG is composed from three groups of tasks. The tasks that become before the tests. In the middle, we can see the tests. And in the end, the tasks that, that come after the tests. In the tasks that are, that are the tests, and you can see below, we try to mimic as much as we can the work of the user, the work of the data scientist that play on the system. And as you can see, we are running the project, as we saw in the demo, waited for its completion, then start asserting uh, our asserts uh, on uh, the model and the insights, went to the hypothesis space and to Insight Studio and continue, so on and so on, the rest of the work of the data scientist. And this tag long was around 250 lines. Pretty long, but it was stable. We built our DAG uh, stably. Now, the next question that I need to answer is, how can I scale my DAG? How can I scale my tests? And I want to get something that will be looked like this. I want to put a lot of projects and do the same tests over and over again. So the naive way is to duplicate the code over and over again. And I, I will guess that all, you, all of you will agree that this is not the right, uh, right way to do it. You won't get a stable, uh, uh, easy to maintain, uh, easy duck to maintain, and you probably uh, work very hard to achieve it. And uh, the duck long will be thousands of lines, which is very bad. So this is what we try to do. We try to leverage the advantage of Airflow to create DAG programmatically. And the way we did it is we created a very short design. Uh, we created a class that when we initiate, we initialize the class, we give it a list of projects. And as you can see, the project list. And one of the functions in the class is create all the test tasks. And this function is running in a for loop and going over all the projects in the project list. Uh, and by, this, by that, we got the design that we, we wanted. We have ability to scale our DAG uh, pretty easily. Now, if you think about it, we have ability to, we have the tests that are stable. We have a design that create, uh, that can help us create scaling up uh, our DAGs, but there is still one thing that is missing, which is, the, which are the projects. Now, we took, our data scientists in the company and asked them to build the, a list of projects and they came back to us with more than 160 different uh, projects. Uh, each one of them is different from the, the rest of the project. Some of them use different data sizes. Some of them use different learning parameters. Some of them use different contexts, different types in the data and so on and so on. You saw in the example uh, how many uh, flexibility the system give to the user. So think about those projects. Some of the projects are real use cases that we uh, did to our client. We inspired beyond taking a lot, a lot of pro bono activities uh, and the data, we get the data as part of the pro bono and we use those. So we do believe that this uh, more than 160 uh, projects give us good coverage on the flexibility and the features that the Discovery Platform has. Now, we finally got to see how our DAG is looking like. This is a DAG that runs on a weekly basis, as you can see in the scheduling. And we can see that when we initialize the class, initiate the class, 
and we give it the demo project list, which is a list of 40 projects out of the more than 160 projects that the data scientists uh, created for us. And we can see that from 250 lines, our DAG will shrink into less than 30 lines. And it's much easier to maintain it, much easier to understand it, and it's running. Now, this DAG including around 230 uh, different tasks in less than 30 lines. And this our DAG is looking like. Now, if you remember, I also said uh, before that we got the ability to compare our results uh, to previous ones. And in order to do it, we took the results of Airflow and create a view project above it. And this project compare the different things that we want to uh, detect during the release cycle. As you can see, we are comparing the score during the release as time goes by. We are comparing the learning time, the total learning time, and each one of the phases that we didn't drill down into it in the demo. And we also have the ability to compare the features, the, the, the insights that the system produce. Uh, this help us a lot to understand if we are uh, doing regressions or uh, having performance issues due to changes that we are doing. And we are doing this for each and every one of the projects that we have that the data scientists created for us. So it's very hard to detect the changes, but we have a tool that can do it. So we use it. And finally, we got to talk about load tests. And the first question should be, why at all do I want to do load tests? And the answer is actually pretty easy. We know our clients. We know what they are doing. Some of them use uh, the system heavily and push it to the limit, take it to the edge. And we talked before, how much is it, is it important for us to get a quality product? And in order our client to get a quality product, we need, a, we need to test it in advance. And we need to test as much as we can the thing that they are going to do. And, and therefore, simple tests are not going to be enough. If I run over and over the same test, I probably, that, I probably won't catch uh, the things that they are going to catch or they are going to face when they will use the system. So if I know that they are using heavily the system, let me test the same thing. Let me test the system when it's in heavily usage. Now, after I understand that I'm going to do low test, I need to ask myself, how go, I will go, I going to do it? And the answer, it is not going to be trivial because I need interface, uh, infrastructure. And the infrastructure is not simple. I need four things for, for my infrastructure. First, I, win, I need it to be able to schedule tasks. I need it uh, to, to have dependency between the, uh, the tasks that I'm running. I need uh, to have retry mechanism. And the last, ability to control the load. Now, implementing each and every one of those is very hard. Implement all of them is even harder. And just to show you an example how hard it's going to be, we can look on this picture and understand. In football, the attack team has four retries to get to the next line. In order to do it, all of the team members need to play together. They need to do the task synchronizedly and on the same time. Now, most of the time, you can guess what happened. You're right. They're going to find themselves on the ground, and a bunch of people are going to jump off the, on, on them, and the ball is going to go away. Bad luck. Sometimes they do succeed with their work, but many times this is what happened. And this is because of the complexity of creating such infrastructure. Now, just think about it. I want to create complex infrastructure, and it's very important for me because when I will run my tests and I won't have the confidence in my infrastructure, I will have to give excuses why the issues that I'm finding relate to the product that I'm testing and not to the infrastructure. So I need to find an infrastructure that I can trust. Give me the trust that I need. So I will know that every issue that I'm finding relate to the product that I'm testing. And if you think of it, it's going to be airflow. Um, and let's, let's see, I need four things. 
dependency between tasks we are giving by definition. This is the definition of the DAG. Scheduler, airflow as scheduler. We need retry mechanism. In each and every task in airflow, there are retry mechanism. It's already implemented. And last, we need the ability to control the load. And to control the load, we have the, the pool. We can create pool on set of tasks and control the amount of load that we want by uh, defining the, this pool. So I think that by using Airflow, we got the, the confidence that we looked for, uh, and it saved us a lot of time in implementation, plus we got confidence. And finally, we can see Airflow in action. We are going to see now a real issue that we found thanks to Airflow, uh, and without Airflow, it's going to be very hard to identify. And in order to understand it, we first need to understand the architecture of Discovery Platform. And Discovery Platform has actually very simple architecture. There are master and multiple workers. The master is supposed to do all the work, while the workers are supposed to uh, suppose, sorry, the master is supposed to delegate all the work, and the workers are supposed to and the link of the calculation, ideally. Now, as you can see in the Gantt Builder, uh, there are five tasks that were failed uh, on the same time. So we said to ourselves, okay, what shall I do? I should run them separately. We run all of those five tasks separately. And guess what? All of them passed successfully. So the first thing that we had in mind, let's take this scenario and duplicate into developer environment. So we will be able to uh, uh, debug it as probably you do in most of the cases. I guess that you also do the same. But in low test, this is a real problem because low tests are every scenario. For example, those five tasks failed after 10 hours and multiple tasks that were running over one after another. And after there is load, and it's very hard to duplicate. So after we understand this, uh, we had no choice and we had to uh, take different approach and debug the issue. So this is what we did. First, we looked on the log of Discovery Platform of our product. We looked on the master log and looked on the worker log, and guess what? We didn't find anything. So what we had to do, we said to ourselves, if there is nothing in the log, let's look in the log of the general CTA. And thanks to Airflow, thanks to the Gantt view, we knew exactly what was the time, what was the time um, uh, that the five tasks were failed. So what we did, is looking at the exact time in the John CTL, and we were very surprised to see that the master got out of memory. We found all. So after we understand we, are, we are got out of memory, we looked on each and every one of the tasks, look on the last request that they sent, because there were, it was API request test, um, and start to investigate all of those five requests in the code, and found that one of the requests is uh, running on the master which, as I said before, the master doesn't supposed to do anything, just delegate work to the uh, platform, to the worker. Now, without the confidence in the system, as I said before, in the infrastructure, we couldn't be sure that the problem is in discovery platform and not in the infrastructure. And thanks to the long gathering and the uh, Gantt view, we were able to identify the issue pretty easily. Now, let me try to summarize what I just talked in all this session. Uh, so first, thanks to the advantage of Airflow to, uh, to create DAG programmatically, we were able to scale up our DAGs pretty easily, uh, get maintainable projects, and that is also well designed. Second, the ability of Airflow to, to be the infrastructure so to our load test. Uh, Airflow is dependency between tasks, scheduling, um, rich line mechanism, and also uh, ability to control the load. And last, and we got the confidence by using uh, Airflow as our infrastructure to the load test, and the Gantt view and the log gathering help us identify uh, complex bug that we had in our system that was almost impossible to do it without Airflow. Uh, and now, before I will ask you to join us in Spark Beyond, if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask. <laughs>